The King James says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Anybody has issues? <laughs> it's in the heart. <laughs> comes out of the heart. And then the Passion Translation says, so above all, guard the affections of your heart, for they affect all that you are. Now the word heart in the Hebrew is levab, which means thoughts, will, discernment, and affections. Guard the affections of your heart, the thoughts of your heart, the discernment or judgments that you make in your heart, and the will, the decisions that you make in your heart. Because they will affect all that you are, all that you do, the course of your life, and the life and the issues that flow out of it. Isn't that good? Like, we could just read the Bible and be like, that's good. <laughs> you know, I don't have to do any more explaining. <laughs> guard diligently means to observe like a guard on post. Gives me the idea of, you know, of something that is consistently happening. You know, something that we're consistently doing. Um, and, and, and I want to be very clear on something. Uh, when, when we get the idea of guarding our heart, it's not from a place of fear. It's not from a place of like, oh my gosh, no, no, no. You know, like, uh oh. Like, you're not running scared. You're not afraid. You know, it's not from a place of fear, but instead it's from a place of protection, from a place of knowing that what you put in your heart, you know, is very important because it's going to plant there. See, our heart. Is, is, a, is a garden, is a vineyard. You know, Nick was talking about a heart is like the soil, right? So it's very important what we put in the soil of our heart because out of it, it's like a garden. What are you cultivating in your garden? What are you putting in there? Because it's going to grow and then you're going to eat from it and it's going to, you know, life or death is going to come out of it. The course of your life is going to come out of what you're putting in the soil of your heart. So we must, be careful with our heart, right? We must protect what goes on in our heart. We should observe it diligently, not from fear. See, that's very important because a lot of people have been like, made this like almost, uh, you know, a very scary thing where people are overly reacting to everything because out of fear. No, instead, it's just like a guard on post, you know? You're checking what's going in. And here's the other important thing. When you're experiencing things and issues of life, you know, look at your heart. You know, ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, is there something in my heart that is actually producing that? Is there something in my heart that is actually attracting abusive people into my life? Is there something in my heart? Is there a lie in my heart that is telling me that I need to put up with rejection or that I need to settle for less than the best? Right? Because then it's very likely that I might be attracting these things. See? It says, for it guard your heart above all else, New Living Translation, for it determines the course of your life. Most relational and emotional issues that you experience are rooted in your heart. The way you relate to most of them, the way they feel, the way they taste, the way they look, the way that you perceive them is because of the filters that are in your heart. I can say something in the service, you know, and because of the filters in your heart, you can hear something completely different. That's so why we pray that it's not my words or, or my teaching, but it's the Holy Spirit translating and speaking straight into your heart because knowledge is not going to change us. It's when we actually take it and rewrite our heart with the truth of God that it changes us, that it transforms us. Okay, so let's go to Song of Solomon. And, you know, you can look it up, and if not, I'm going to read it to you, because I'm reading out of the Passion Translation. Um, it's the one uh, by Brian Simmons. And, uh, is it Simmons or Sims? I don't want to be saying it wrong. Simmons, right? Simmons, yeah. Um, Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 1 and verse 6. It says... So yeah, I'll read it to you in, in the NIV also so you can see the difference. Um, Song of Solomon 1.6 says, Do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were angry with me and made me take care of the vineyards, 
my own vineyard I have neglected. Okay, that's the NIV. Uh, the Passion Translation uh, it says, Please don't stare in scorn because of my dark and sinful ways. My angry brothers quarreled with me and appointed me guardian over their ministry vineyards. I have not guarded my vineyard within. What it's telling us here is that she has become the keeper of their vineyards while her own vineyard, what is the vineyard? The heart, right? It's a picture of the heart. While her own vineyard is overgrown with weeds, she's had no time to make herself, desi make herself desirable for her lover, right? Because remember, Song of Solomon is describing to us a relationship between Jesus and the bride, so between Jesus and us is describing our personal relationship with him. And it's saying, we're so busy. We're so busy that we have not taken care of our own vineyard. That we have not watched over our heart. That we have not done what we just read in Proverbs about guarding our heart diligently, looking over it. Because we're so busy with life. We're so busy with everybody else's vineyard. We're so busy taking care of everybody else and solving everybody else's problem. But see... Like, even the Bible tells us, how can you, you know, pull out a, a speck out of your brother's eye when you have, you know, this huge thing stuck in your own? When we haven't taken care of our own heart, how can we, you know, continue being busy with life and everybody else's burdens? So, the bride right here is busy and overburdened with everyone's expectations. Has that happened to you before? You know, you're so busy with everybody else and you feel drained and dry. You're trying to please everybody else, but you're just like pff, running like with like an engine with no oil. Overheating. Yeah. Okay, maybe it's just me. I don't know. Our first responsibility before God is our own personal walk with Jesus, guarding, protecting and nourishing our own heart. See, like, this might sound a little selfish, and, and, and I'm not saying to be selfish. I'm not saying to be self-centered. I'm not saying to not care about everybody else. That's not what I'm saying. But see, e even, uh, you know, I don't know when the last time you were on a flight, but they still do the same little show. You know, they show you how to put your belt on, and they say, in case that the cabin loses pressure, you know, these oxygen masks are going to drop from from the ceiling, right? And what do they tell you? They tell you, put your own, put your own first. Put yours first, right? And then help the ones around you. Why? Because if you have no oxygen and you're dead, you can't help anybody else. Right. See, like, I, I know examples from, from pastor, you know, but you need to know examples, you know, from what you do. You know, from moms, from, from, uh, from spouses, from employees, from people that run businesses and stuff like that. Like, I know the percentage of pastors that, that, that start in ministry and that actually end, you know, 20 years later, it's, it's a huge drop. It's a huge drop. It's like, I don't know, like 20% of them are actually in ministry 10 years later, 20 years later. Because they are taking care of everybody else except themselves. You know, they're putting oxygen masks on everybody without taking oxygen themselves. See, but the same thing can happen in your life. You could be taking care of your children, of your spouse, of your, you know, everything, your work, your household, and always serving others, but never taking care of your own vineyard. And then eventually, you're not going to last. We need to think about sustainability too. <clears throat> How easily can we be driven by the need for approval from others rather than our own need for fellowship with Jesus? God's true servants do not strive or speak harshly to those keeping watch over their flock like the angry brothers were doing to her. And maybe you've experienced this, and it's not right. Maybe you experienced the angry brothers, the religious people in the church, you know, that are beating you over to take care of their vineyards with angry words, with harsh words, with uh, 
abused in some way or another and you've been hurt and you have this bad taste from church because, because you experienced some angry brothers that were making you take care of their vineyard through manipulation and control and, and you know, telling you all these religious things and then what happens is you burned out because you, nobody, you didn't take care of your own heart. And the truth is that we could be angry at the brothers, but we're responsible for setting healthy boundaries and for protecting our own heart and nourishing ourselves. We're responsible for having grown cold or hard-hardened. Nobody forces you to stay in an abusive environment. Right, so e even though we've been experienced, even though we've been under those things, or even if you, you know, in your life or in your past were, were ever in a position like that, whether it was a church or whether it was a, at a work situation or whether it was at home, wherever it was, you know, the responsibility lies in us for our own relationship with Jesus, for our own walk with Him, for knowing Him, and for taking care of our heart. I can tell you that I've been in both. I've been in places where I'm like, Thriving, taking care of my heart, you know, stuff. And I've been in places where I'm so busy taking care of everybody else and everything else that I, you know, all of a sudden I just feel depleted. My wife's living with like a crabby husband. <laughs> and it's like, hey, what's going on in your heart? <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean my heart? How do you know my heart? Don't judge my heart. <laughs> it's like, exactly that's what I'm, you know. I'm like, oh. Hold on, this isn't right. I need to go. I need to go check. I need to go take care of this thing, right? Where's this coming from? <laughs> We're just being real, right? Um, taking responsibility aside from God's grace is a recipe for burnout. Taking on responsibility and things and, and busyness without the grace of God is a recipe for burnout. Overworked labors in God's vineyard will be discouraged and sometimes even quit. How many times have we seen this? Sad. Weariness takes our joy and makes us feel guilty that we're not doing more for God. And this all becomes a re religious yoke. Here's what happens. People get saved. They're joyful. But there's two ways this can go. One, it could go the religious way, and one, it could go the healthy way, the Jesus way, relationship. Okay? The religious way is you get saved, and religion is put on you and tells you, all right, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to change that. Da, 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 da. Here's a list of stuff, right? So you work really hard and you get it done, right? And then now you have to serve. So now you serve, 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 serve. And then you're like getting burned out, and they're like, no, 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 you got to push through, you got to push through, you got to push through. So then you push through. But it comes to a point where you just completely collapse. And when that collapse happens, you've lost the joy of your salvation. You're scarred. And you flee. And you're disconnected. And you're hurt. And you think that because you flee and you don't have to be there or under that or with those people anymore, you think that that's that it's going to be okay, but the truth is you still have not dealt with your vineyard. You still haven't dealt with your heart. So you carry it on to the next church, you carry it on to the next job, you carry it on to the next marriage, you carry on to the next situation in life, and guess what? Because that's in your heart and you haven't dealt with it, it's going to come out again. And all that's going to happen is you're going to waste a whole bunch of time because you didn't deal with the thing that needed to be dealt with, which is your heart. See, but instead, God invites us into salvation, right? He's at the door knocking. So when you're saved, you're supposed to also get healed, delivered, set free, right? So salvation should lead us into a process or into a, 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 a stage or, or a season of healing, of dealing with your heart, getting healed. You know, it's like you come out of the out of the war, and, and you know, you, you took some beatings, you took some bullets, you took some uh, wounds and stuff. Now, there has to be a process of healing your heart. Inner healing, you know. Sozo. 
whatever it is, you know, forgiveness. That's what the Bible tells us, to give from what we have freely received. So the moment you receive forgiveness and you're saved, you're supposed to also start giving that away. You're supposed to give forgiveness. You're supposed to deal with the wounds in your heart and the things that, you know, that are from your past so that you don't drag them into this relationship with Jesus. Because if not, you're going to start seeing Jesus through the eyes of the past too. Like, whoa, he wants my money? Hmm. No, you're seeing this through the eyes of the past of the people that ripped you off before, the people that disappointed you before, and it's not the same person, it's not the same relationship. So when you come into a relationship with Jesus, you're supposed to heal your heart. You're, you know, salvation means healing, wholeness, being whole again. And when you're made whole again, then you go into preparation stage where you're now, you know, knocking down all the lies, you know, killing all the sacred cows and, and you're replacing it with the truth of God and you're being built up in your identity and this new identity you have because God tells you, you are the baked cookie, the baked cake, the finished cupcake, you know. He sees you, and, and it's amazing. If you, if you uh, get a hold of the Passion Translation Song of Songs um, or you just start watching these teachings from Kara, it's been like four so far, um, it's amazing because you see the bride uh, walk into a relationship of grace with Jesus and how Jesus is always speaking identity to her. He's always telling her, this is who you are. You are precious for me. You are perfect. You are beautiful. You're, you're amazing. And she's like, what is he talking about? Why? Because he sees her all the finished work. Jesus finished the work so he could see us through his finished work. Finished too. Because he is the first one to cause the things that are not as though they were. Remember, he's out of time. He sees us already done, completed. Yep. So, we are responsible for our heart. We don't want to fall into religious yoke or into the busyness of life and not take care of our heart. When we find our identity in what we do for God, instead of intimacy with Christ, we can lose our vision. You know, so many people are in this uh, religious rat race. You know, of doing, 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 doing. Burn out, do more. Tired, push through, do more. And there's no grace. And you're just burning out. And sometimes we see that and we're like, okay, hold on. You need to go, you need to spend some time healing and taking care of your heart before you serve again. Because if your identity is wrapped up in everything that you can do for God, you've missed it completely. And you have to come out of that and you have to come into a relationship, you have to deal with the things in your heart, though some of them might be ugly, though some of them might feel painful, you need to deal with them. He's so good and so gentle in how he does it. Because then when you're whole and healed, you know, then you can prepare, then you can step out, then you can, then you can do everything that he's called you to do, all the desires of your heart, all this stuff, you know. And here's the thing, the preparation season and the healing season, you know, it only takes as long as you want it to take. Right? I mean, a lot of these things are available to us and up to us of how long we're there. It's like the children of Israel, right? They left Egypt. It's another desert. What is it, a two-week journey? Right? It's like a, something like that. It's a very short journey walking from Egypt to the promised land. I mean, you can look at the maps, you could, you know. And it takes him 40 years. Why? Right? So you can make this a 40-year 40 40 year long trip. You could keep resentment in your heart, unforgiveness. You could keep punishing people because of what they did to you. But the truth is, the, only, the one that is being harmed the most is you because you're the one in the desert going around. Going around, you know, instead of dealing with your heart so that you can walk into the promised land, everything God has called you to do, everything God has given you, you know, going to the land that flows with milk and honey. Oh, but it's painful to go there. It's pain yes, but it must be done. You have to take care of your vineyard. You have to pull the weeds out. Otherwise, your life is always going to look and taste that way. 
All right. Is this helping anybody? It's, it's important that we constantly guard our heart and watch our heart. And if something comes out of this, like out of character or something chronic, then you go to the Holy Spirit. And if you can't work it out by yourself, then you go to someone else that you trust to help you. And that's where vulnerability comes in. But I'll tell you that in your most vulnerable moments are your, most, your greatest victories. We don't like to be vulnerable, but, you know, Jesus' greatest victory was in one of his most vulnerable moments. Naked, on the cross, beaten, being crucified and punished for something he didn't deserve. And that's the foundation of our victorious life, right? Okay, you guys are looking at me like, way too serious, man. I've got to put them Hawkins back up again, please. Remember how ladies laugh? <laughs> so, if you're finding your identity in what you do, you need to, back to go back to the drawing board and deal with your heart. So, in other words, stop doing anything and find joy, find peace, find delight in just being in His presence, just being in His house, just, you know... Um, Cultivating the heart is a daily responsibility that must be taken seriously. You've seen people, any of you have gardens? Any of you have gardens? Okay. So, okay. so people that have gardens, they know they have to take care of them, right? Because if you don't and you just neglect them, what's going to happen? Automatically stuff is going to be all over them, right? You know, plagues or insects or whatever. You have to cultivate it. Now, cultivating is not works and it's not religion. Cultivating it is taking care of it. It's being a good steward over your heart. It is easy to blame the angry brothers, but truly we're the ones who have grown cold. You and others will tell yourself that you can't afford to take time to be alone with God. Go with me to Luke chapter 10. You know, if you think about when's the last time you read your Bible, when's the last time you spent time in prayer, you know, a significant amount of time, something that actually spoke to you. Um, and if you come up with that kind of answer, you know, next week we'll talk about it. But there really, we really can't have an excuse to not spend time with God. And coming to church is not, the thing that's going to hold your relationship together. Coming to church is awesome. It's great. Don't miss out. You know, you get the word. You get encouraged. You get a community with one another. It's family. You know, it's corporate time of worship. It's powerful. But your relationship with Jesus is every day. Every day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And still Sunday. Not just at church, but out of church. Imagine if you only saw your spouse once a week. What kind of relationship is that? I mean, you have friends that you see more than once a week. Well, shouldn't you spend time with Jesus more than that? Okay. Luke chapter 10, uh, verse 38. It says, As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. See, Martha and Mary, sisters, Jesus coming to the house. Martha is serving. How many Marthas are here? You know? She's serving. She's getting everything ready. She's all worried, all anxious, all like, and, and Mary is just at the feet of Jesus, listening to everything that Jesus has to say. Just being at his presence, just being at his feet, doing nothing but sitting at his feet. 
And Martha comes and she's like, hey, Jesus, tell her to help me. Like, look at her. She's doing nothing. And now we would think Jesus would be like, yeah, oh yeah, come on, Mary, get up. You know, go help your sister. Don't be lazy, you know. Like, but no, right? Jesus is like, actually, she chose the better thing. She's like, what? Don't you think all this stuff needs to be prepared? She's like, she chose the better thing. The better thing is being at the feet of Jesus. Because it's the more important thing. We think, we, we think the more important thing is to have everything done. Everything ready. Everything prepared. Like, that's not the most important thing. Jesus clear, clearly tells us the most important thing is to be with me. It's to spend time with me. It's to be at my feet. To be in my presence. Why would that be? Maybe Jesus knows that if we're at his feet and we're in his presence... Even if it seems like we're doing nothing, we're probably getting more and we're getting set up to be successful with the rest of everything else, with the rest of life, with the rest of our day. Maybe if you started applying this principle and spending time in your word and spending time with Jesus and, and prayer and recognizing him as the first thing and the most important, even however long that is, you gave the importance, the priority of your life. Maybe the rest of your day will be surprisingly amazing for you. Because why would Jesus say, Mary picked the better thing? Because it's the better thing, right? It's the thing that is most important. So nothing else matters but to spend time with Jesus. Then everything else will line up. You know, Matthew 6, it says, Seek first my kingdom, and everything else will be added unto you. So being anxious and getting things ready and checking one more thing off your checklist is not worth sacrificing time with the Lord. But I don't have time. Let me tell you something. You can't afford not to have time. Because here's what's going to happen. If you keep neglecting the time with Jesus and building your personal relationship with your Savior, you're going to need an emergency pretty soon. You're going to need a dramatic experience with Jesus to pull you out of the place you've dug yourself into for so long without taking care of your heart. I don't want to have to need an emergency. You know, where I'm like completely, I don't want to have to have an engine overhaul because I didn't put oil in. I want to just go in, you know, and get the oil changed every 3,000 miles. I'm not saying that you spend time with Jesus every 3,000 miles. Okay? They're like, ah, oh yeah, I can do that. No, that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's maintenance. <laughs> it's like maintenance to a car instead of having to replace the whole engine. It's the same thing. You spend time with him daily so that you don't get to a place where you're burned out, hurt, wounded, and you just need like this, you know, big overhaul in your spiritual life. It's about our history. It's about our, you know, our daily living with him. Are you with me? Okay. So, it's not saying what Martha was doing was wrong. It's just saying Mary picked the better thing. And I believe if you do what Mary did first, then you could do what Martha did better. You got that? Okay. So, Song of Songs, this is we're going to end... Uh, Song of Songs, uh, chapter 1, verse 8. I'm going to read. Let me see where I'm going. Okay, I'm good. I have a couple minutes. Um, I'm going to read you the, the uh, well, the Passion Translation. The Passion Translation is, is amazing because it's, it's like interpreted. Um, but I'll read you the other one so you also see. Uh, chapter 1, verse 8. It says, listen, my lover... Oh, no, I'm sorry. Um, if you do not know, most beautiful of women, follow the tracks of the sheep and grace your young goats by the tents of the shepherds. Okay. Let me read you the Passion Translation. This is what it's saying. It says, listen, my radiant one, if you ever lose sight of me, just follow in my footsteps where I lead my lovers. And check this out. Come with your burdens and cares. 
Now, right there where it says graze your goats, it's a metaphor that speaks of her responsibilities and labors. Okay? Her responsibilities and her labors. That's what it's speaking to. It's saying, come with your burdens and your cares. Come to the place near. So Jesus is telling us, come with your responsibilities, with your burdens, with your things. Cast them onto me, right? Psalms 55, 22, uh, Passion Translation says, so here's what I've learned through it all. Leave your cares and anxieties at the feet of the Lord. Leave your cares and anxieties at the feet of the Lord. Who was at the feet of the Lord? Mary, right? Mary was at the feet of the Lord. Mary chose the better thing. Leave your cares and anxieties at the feet of the Lord, and measureless grace will strengthen you. Measureless grace will strengthen you when you leave your cares and anxieties at the feet of the Lord. What do you think that grace is for? If you remember just a few minutes ago, we said any responsibilities that we take or anything that we do without the grace of God is a recipe for burnout. When you come to the feet of Jesus, when you choose the better thing like Mary did, and you leave your cares and your burdens at his feet, and you spend time in his presence, you spend time in his word, you spend time pouring your heart out to him and, 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 and just giving it all to him. He's going to give you exactly this thing. Measureless grace that will strengthen you. You know what? To do the things that need to be done. With grace, strength, and without burnout. We don't want people to burn out. The most important thing for us here, even as pastors and churches, your heart. We don't care what you do or what you can do. If your heart's not right, we'd rather you don't do it. We've told people before, like, hey, you know, why don't you just, we'll find someone else to do it. Yeah, maybe they can't do it as excellent as you, but just take care of your heart. You know, and, and, and take the identity of who you are off of what you're doing. Regain your identity from what he says, who he says you are. It has nothing to do with what you do. Everything, with, everything to do with what he did. And then come back to a place where you can continue serving and doing the things and the desires of your heart from a healthy place. Amen.